Well, hold on to your hats, folks. Today I'm in a folding hardtop sort of convertible, but with the roof on because of the wind. Isn't that fun? In 2004, Vauxhall in Britain and Opel in mainland Europe stunned the motoring world with the arrival of the Astra H, a new angular, sharply styled take on their ever popular C-segment Focus rival. Initially, it was just a five-door hatch, then an estate car, then the GTC Coupe, which moved into other markets, and then finally, two years later, they brought us this, the twin top, the folding roof coupe. Now, the Astra H was based on General Motors' new Delta platform, which replaced the J and Z platforms. Now, around the world, it went on to be the foundation of a bunch of other cars. The Astra H, Zafira B, Saturn Ion, Chevy HHR, Chevy Cobalt, Pontiac G5, a real roll call of the automotive greats there. It was discontinued in 2009, except in this form, the twin top. Now, there seems to be some great unspoken consensus among car manufacturers around the millennium that folding hardtops are no longer going to be the preserve of expensive things like Mercedes, which had the SLK back in the 90s. Suddenly, there was a glut of them. The Peugeot 207cc, the Megane Coupe convertible. Focus had a folding hardtop. There was the Volkswagen Eos, which came on a little bit later on as well. There are just loads of them. And of course, this effort from Vauxhall. Now, where the Astra differed from some of its rivals is rather than using a two-piece roof that folded into the boot, it used a three-piece, which gives a couple of advantages. By folding in two places, you can have a different roof line, which is much more coupe-like and more sleek-looking and more natural and quite attractive when the roof is up. And into the A-pillars, the windscreen doesn't have to extend quite so far back, so that can look more natural and perhaps even share components with the uh, regular coupe. Additionally, because this is a fairly short section here, you can inspect this as an option of a panoramic glass roof. And finally, practically, because of the way it folds up, you can squeeze this into a tighter space so the roof will go down and take up less of your precious luggage room because that is a big problem with folding hardtops. You put the roof down, your boot disappears. And that's actually not such a problem with this car. Let's take a look. Now, getting into the trunkal area of the car, there's a nice big handle under here with an annoyingly loud button, which if you keep pushing it with your hand in the same place, will keep on releasing the button all the way up, making a really irritating noise. Once you're inside, it's a really quite big boot for a coupe. It's 440 litres, which is pretty much immense. When the roof is down, that drops down to 205 litres because you've got 235 litres of roof taking up a lot of the top of it. Now, in the main section, you've got quite a deep, deep square area for larger bags. Underneath that, there is a, a space where you could either have a space over a spare tyre. There isn't one in this car, it's just a, a pump kit. Um, and you can hide more stuff under there, so add a few litres onto that 205 total. Um, and if you're not putting the roof down, you've got a larger area here, so you can stack things out sideways, like a big capital T. Here you do have a couple of little cubby holes off to the left and the right. One's got an elastic strap, one's got an elastic net, so you can hide smaller items and stop them being rattling around in the trunk. You've got a little light, and you've got four lash down points, so you can keep things from flying around. And just look at how madly complex these hinges are. That's a one, two, three, four. It's a mad cantilever with a hydraulic strut in the middle of it. It's motorized, it's electric. There are gonna be solenoids and relays in there. Um, in fact, one of the major Achilles heels of this car, and every car has its own little foibles, quirks and foibles, we can call them. That's probably almost like a, a catch line for a series of YouTube videos, quirks and foibles, um, is that the wiring loom through the roof does actually break. It's about 400 pounds to repair it if it does happen. This car has just had that done. And there are a couple of reasons I'm not putting the roof down, largely because every time I go anywhere near the roof button, it suddenly starts spitting with rain and threatening to storm, and I don't want that to happen. And secondly, because the owner has just paid for this to, happen, to be repaired, and it's for sale, and I don't want to risk breaking it on a for sale car that's just been fixed. I have to buy him a new roof. So I'm sure it's absolutely fine. I'm just not risking it, and it's gonna rain. Anyway, right, back into the roof, into the boot area, the trunkal area. You have this pull out cover here, this load space cover. And um, this is your indicator of what is safe to stash in the boot before the roof comes down. So the roof actually won't trigger until you've pulled this net across. So if you're thinking of doing one of the car's little funny party tricks, which is the roof will activate up to 18 miles an hour. So if you're pulling away in traffic, and the sun comes out, you can just hit the button as you pull away from the lights and the roof will just fold itself back. Very swank. But you need to remember to put this back before you set off if you want to pull that trick. Now, they are adamant that nothing goes beyond the height of this net. There is a sticker here, a sticker on the net itself, and a sticker here showing nothing to the sides, nothing on top, nothing pushing up through the net, everything under the net. Do not go above the net. They are clear on the net. The net is a big thing for them. 
um, I think if that were to be in the wrong place, some damage would happen. Now, when you've got everything in the boot and your boot is full of roof and you want to access your luggage, there is something they call easy store. Easy store button. The idea is as you open the boot, it raises your folded roof ever so slightly so you can access your bags from underneath it. It takes about 20 seconds to do and it's quite, quite an interesting little thing to show off with the first couple of times you show the neighbours and your friends and relatives, look what my car boot does. Although after about a year, you might start finding that particular joke wearing thin. Just saying. Anyway, it's a big enough boot for a coupe, so well done Vauxhall. Also, when you drop the thing, be super careful with it. Don't bang it, just let it drop. All of the Astra H series got this new sharply styled face with the Griffin housed in the V and these big angular lights with a crease down the center of them actually. Now I always quite liked this style. I, I do like an angular car anyway, I've got the W204 on. Um, so I think it looks actually quite good. Um, it's got lots of chrome detailing, which if you like chrome detailing is a good thing. And uh, yeah, it's just quite sharply styled. It's got quite a nice presence really. This one comes with front fog lights and the sportier front lip of the coupe. Here under the bonnet, unsurprisingly, you will find an engine. There are three choices of petrol Ecotec and one choice of diesel uh, powering this thing. Now there are really only two of those engines you want to be choosing. First of all, let's forget the diesel because it's a soft top or a hard open top. You don't want a clattery old diesel chugging away like a tractor in front of you. You're not going to look cool down the high street with that thing going on, are you? Uh, second of all, we've got the 1.6 litre four cylinder non turbocharged petrol. It makes 104 horsepower, which in a car with an electric motors and the big, big metal roof, reinforced chassis weighing about a ton and a half or so, that is slow. I mean, painfully slow, as in you won't want to drive the car slow. So forget that one as well. Then you've got two others. First of all, you've got the two litre turbo, which is a bit of a screamer. It's 198 horsepower or 200 PS, so around that kind of point. But bear in mind, They've cut the roof off this thing, so it's not as dynamically competent as the coupe GTC versions of the car. So that might be a bit much for the chassis. So here we have the Goldilocks engine, the 1.8 non-turbo. It makes 138 horsepower or 140 PS, whatever that means. Um, and it's a nice, fairly reliable unit. There's a couple of things go wrong with it. For example, the water pumps fail and that takes you various little bits and pieces out. So you've got to change them. The cam belts have to be done like bang on time or early if you possibly can, because they fail. and cause lots of other gubbins to break as well. Uh, this particular one has had a sports exhaust added right away from the manifold down, so that does make it sound quite fruity. In standard form, the miles per gallon from this sweet spot in the middle is around 29 through to 47, depending on urban combined, yada yada. So somewhere around the high 30s mark should be realistic in this car. As I pulled the door handle, it dropped the glass like on you know, new shaped minis and various other coupes. This car is pillarless, so I can put down both the front and rear windows and have myself, even with the roof up, a very much open air experience. Now the way they make these cars affordable is it shares its interior with the rest of the Astra range. So sitting in here, it could be any Astra H you care to name. So you've got reach and height adjustment on the steering wheel. You've got the same lighting controls and stalks as you find in other Astras and the Vectra and that kind of thing. It's all, it's all sturdy stuff. It's it got the feel it's going to last a good long time. It's not going to be fragile and snap off in your hands. It shares these long doors with the coupe and apparently shares the roof, or at least the roof mechanism, with the Pontiac G6. In the door itself, you've got this rather nice sort of dark chrome insert. Well, it's a dark chrome, it's like a dark chrome plastic insert. A uh, metal feeling door handle and a little speaker up top and a mid-range speaker down the bottom. So, you know, a bit of decent audio happening there. Got a nice firm door pull. This door card feels really, really solid, like a shoon from something solid and granite-like, maybe even granite. Uh, faux leather uh, areas where you sort of brush your hand against on the side, and then some slightly rubbery plastics for the, the bulk of the door. Actually, that feels a bit more fragile back there, where they're not expecting you to touch it. That's a weird rubbery feel to that. Uh, big, big door pocket, it kind of bulges out at the front, almost indicating you can maybe hide a bottle in there, but I think that might be a bit tight for that if you tried. Then of course in the front corner you've got your four electric window switches and your electric mirror switch. And moving on to the dashboard, we have got all of our lighting controls. Ooh, illuminations. Here in this continuation of the fake dark chrome plastic trim strip, we've got our large round light switch for the headlights, auto headlights should you so wish, and to the left of that, You've got your front and rear fog light switches, one above the other. Top right, you've got a push out button, pop 
push and it pops out for the trip reset and also to darken and brighten your uh, dashboard controls lights and then you've got your other one which pushes and pops out which is the headlamp angle so if you've got heavy weights in the boot you can lower and raise your headlights. The dials are nice and big and clear they're not Rover R8 big and clear which is also Honda Civic big and clear they are my go-to 10 out of 10 these are big and clear redlining at six and a half thousand rpm on the rev counter on the left and hitting 160 miles an hour on the speedo i don't think it's going to do that but hey, it's nice to dream and of course we've got a fuel gauge in the center and a bit of dead space in the middle where i guess any warning lights are going to come on but apparently there's no temperature gauge at all on this car Moving back from the dashboard, we've got these two big obelisks of stalks. Oh my word, it's making beepy noises. The one on the right is your windscreen wipers. The one on the left is for dipping your headlights, your indicators, and resetting stuff on, I believe, cruise control by the look of that. As well as those functions, it will also do parking lights. Push it down for left, push it up for right, when the ignition is in this kind of off position with the key in the car, and it will leave the parking lights on. That's quite nice. It's a hidden feature. It's like an Easter egg almost. You'd think they'd make more of that, really, wouldn't you? Now, these indicators, I remember Jeremy Clarkson going off on one about these indicators because when the ignition is on, they just take the lightest brush to start indicating three times, left or right, and then a firmer click to make them go on permanently. But to cancel them, you had to just give it a light touch. And it took a... It was, this was kind of the, one of the first applications of this kind of light touch technology for three clicks from a light touch full click for indicating around a corner and i remember top gear just going crazy about it so, oh there's gonna be scrapyards full of vectors in 20 years time all indicating madly to each other because no one can turn them off and how quickly we all got used to that who knew now the steering wheel oh this is leather steering wheel it's kind of nicely textured top and bottom and perforated leather on the sides where you sit with your hands gripping it the rest of the time um, you've got various controls on there, you've got volume and radio controls on the right and um, some rather cryptic stuff on the left. An up and down dial which I think takes you through the menus on the dashboard. And of course we have our airbag and horn. Don't get those mixed up. It's not a bad horn, very positive. Now in the centre we've got, <laughs> because this car is now, well, 14 years old. This is quite a tiny little screen, which probably looked quite impressive back then, but now it doesn't look quite such a great thing. Uh, the yellow lights on the tiny, tiny bit of LCD looking a bit dated. Moving down from there, we've got a central locking button, hazard warnings, nice and easy to find, and a sport button. Because this is a design model, we've got sport, so we can brighten things up a bit, make things a bit more, a bit more sporty, I'm gonna say. Easy to miss behind the steering wheel rim, you've got the start stop button, because this is, Keyless, so you just hold this somewhere in your pocket, lose it in a, in a cubby hole somewhere, I don't know, put it somewhere where it can get lost and hurt you in the leg or something, I hate keyless. You've got a couple of enormous vents here in the centre, which are controllable for angle left and right and up and down, or individually for both, but no way of turning them down apart from the fan itself. Then this big piano black centre console continues down into the uh, double din radio. It's got FM, AM and CD and MP3, so many, many early noughties options for you just there. Obviously no DAB and that kind of stuff, it's way too soon. Because I've used the screen up here on the top of the dashboard, the entire radio real estate can be given over to giant buttons, which are fairly easy to use when you're on the road and driving, so you don't need to take your hand, eyes too far off the road to go and find what you need. The volume control, most prominent here in the center, a giant dial, which actually kind of matches not only the uh, headlight dial on the right, the same virtually as these temperature controls, which sit below it got air conditioning, recirculation, heated rear window, all in this same piano black, and very simple, just dials for you know, direction, temperature, fan speed. But it's a nice to have a nice family look to everything. It all integrates very well. It's like they've done kind of a high-end a high-end theme, but with basic materials. So it's piano black, but it looks a little bit plasticky. It's nice rubberized buttons, but it's, I don't know. It looks like it wants to be premium, but hasn't quite achieved it. As we scoop down through more of the bottom of the, the piano black area, we have a little covered uh, lighter socket for 12 volt applications and a little rubber bottomed cubby hole for putting sweets and phones. It probably would balance them. So getting rusty noises now. It'll probably balance the phone in there. No, it doesn't, sorry, no. No, forget that, it doesn't balance the phone. It's just for sweets. And then you've got a five speed manual. There was a five speed auto option as well. As I always say, why would you want it? This is 
quite chunky, quite sneaky. It's a huge gear knob to grasp and a lift button underneath so you can push it over to reverse. It clunks in and out of gear quite happily. It's a little bit notchy feeling, but no snagging, no vagueness. It's, yeah, it's good and positive, even if it is a little bit industrial feeling. There's nothing behind there apart from a proper handbrake with a nice chrome button on it, and then a big single cup holder with something I haven't really seen much of before. These little rubber curly points just to kind of grip your cup in there so it doesn't fall over and pour coffee into your seat. And finally, over on the left-hand side, we've got a very, very large twin deck glove box, which has got room for the instruction manual in the top half. Lots of room in the back, it really does go deep. It's a huge glove box. Um, oops, oh dear. And the shelf actually comes out as well, um, intentionally or otherwise. And there's a little light in there, so you can find stuff right at the back when you go on a quest to find whatever pen you've lost in there. And the lid, the glove box lid is actually quite handy as well because you've got a cup holder. This is the only T shelf in the car, I hasten to add. The, uh, the top shelf, if you've got a fairly grippy cup, will probably grip on there because it's very flat, but it's at a slight angle. You've got a large flat area for sandwiches, possibly for cake. And you've got a pen holder here, which might double as a knife holder, so if you want to balance a knife for cutting that cake. And then, what I can only assume is a coin holder for about five pounds worth of pennies. Coming into the rear, there are two things you notice. First of all, how wide these sills are. They've extended and reinforced the actual sill of the car to give it more rigidity and strength. But it does mean you have to step a really long way over it. And second of all, there's not much leg room. <clears throat> or headroom. That's three things I've noticed. Now, in common with a lot of other folding hardtop type cars and coupes in general, because there's less space in the back, it is strictly a two-seater. It's like a two-bucket seat thing going on here. And you've got a bit of a armrest moulded into the door, or the, the sidecar, not even a door card, is it? And a big loud speaker on your shoulder. Something slightly quirky, it makes you feel a bit race car-ish. Your um, three-point seat belts, it does have them, are in the middle of the car, not on the outer edges. So you put them on back to front, which is very much a quirk and foible of this thing. Now, the, I didn't mention where I was in the front. It is like a half leather. I say leather, it's kind of a, a leatherette fake pleather or something, pretend leather. Um, so you have wipe clean edges and a kind of hard wearing fabric in the center. There is a, um, I was gonna call it fold down, but it's more of a fall out. There is a fall out <laughs> armrest, which you can pull out from there. And it actually does reveal access to a ski hatch. So if you've got long loads, they can poke through from the back of the boot there. Now with the seat up, I've got an okay amount of knee room. There's lots of room for my feet to waggle around and not pinned underneath the back of there. And uh, yeah, I don't sit too low or too high, so I'm not too badly off in terms of leg room, but I am banging my head on the ceiling. So it's a coupe, so what do you expect? This is room for kids, not grown-ups. If you, a short trip to the pub, maybe, not a problem. A road trip to Scotland, no, thanks, I'll pass on that. Now it does have one touch windows, which is great, but you do have to remember when you start it, you have to keep your finger on the button until it has started. Otherwise it stops starting and you're kind of aloft, and you're kind of left in a limbo of not running and not on, but it won't do anything else until then. Now it has actually started raining now, which it's been threatening to do for a while, and there's no rear wiper because the coupe. Now the performance from the 1.8 isn't that bad, but it sounds really quite fruity with that sports exhaust on it. I'm not quite sure what the sport button does on this, other than glow a little orange LED. I think the steering becomes more responsive when you push the sport button, so you become a little bit more involved in the drive. Now the gearbox is actually really quite nice once you're on the move. It, uh, it's quite a rewarding thing to, to crunch through. It's a little bit heavy, tiny bit industrial feeling. It moves through quick and easy enough that you're not left wondering what's broken. And I'd much rather have that in a sports car than an automatic. The controls are well laid out, they're easily to hand and the pedals are a nice size and well spaced. And they're even kind of a sporty metal look to make you feel like you're in a sporty car. You're more convincing in the two litre turbo, of course. Now there are three trim levels in this car, Sport, Desire and Exclusive. 
and a couple of special editions as well if we're going to go into that. This being a desire, got lots of toys, front fogs, air conditioning, piano black stuff. And the steering isn't too bad, it's quite accurate and it sends itself quite well. It's a little bit heavy feeling. So we've got the sport button pushed, I'm heading into a hard dropping left hander with a weird camber. Not too bad, didn't feel massively confident though about it. Wouldn't have wanted to push it any faster than that, put it that way. In common with the rest of the Delta platform cars, this uses independent front suspension and torsion beam rear, which is fair enough, it works fine, but it's not the most dynamic and rewarding setup you can put into a car. And when Ford brought out the Mark on Focus just a little while before this came out, it does kind of highlight the difference of what a really well set up independent all-round car can feel like. In a twin top, a coupe convertible, that's not such an issue because it's not kind of really the kind of car you're going to be thrashing and hooning that much anyway. You're going to drive it spiritedly every now and then, but really it's more of a having fun and enjoying the day out kind of car. In things like the, the actual coupe, the GTC, it does become more of an issue because really you want that car to be oh, rapid and fast and fine handling. And that's where the Focus really won out over the Astra. Now apparently, by using torsion beam over independent rear suspension saved around $100 or £100 per car, which in my book isn't enough of a saving over the uh, driving dynamic improvement you would get from having that better suspension. It's a little bit wobbly, coming out of a corner with your foot down, it does want to understeer a bit, it's not really gripping and going, it's more scrabbling and uh, hoping for the best. It doesn't feel like you're going to lose control, but it just doesn't want to play with you. It's not egging you on to just drop a gear and enjoy it. It's very much a cruising car, not an engaging driving car. Yeah, it doesn't really feel like it wants to be pushing hard around that corner. It's more going along with it because I asked nicely. Okay, 0 to 60 test. 30, 40, 50, and that's 60, and now I need to brake a lot because it's a roundabout. Now the brakes are solidly square, but they could be more powerful. The wheel is a big, pleasantly chunky thing in your hand. It does feel quite nice to grip when you're driving. It does feel like you could use a sixth gear though. Now the rest of the Astra H range all finished in 2009, but not the twin top. That soldiered on until 2010, when it finally bit the dust. It wasn't really replaced straight away, but a little bit later on, the Cascada came out, and that was kind of a spiritual successor, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, was also sold as a Buick in America. But these cars aren't without fault. I've already mentioned the um, water pump and uh, cam belt and the wiring in the roof. There's another little foible quirk and foible of this car, which is that the uh, big reinforced box sections of the sills uh, in really heavy rain tend to just collect a lot of water and they fell up a bit and then they slosh. As you're driving around they will slosh and there are drain holes in the bottom which you have to pull out and let them drain and a lot of owners tend to resort to just drilling the holes in the bottom just to let the water out and save them the bother in the future. On the plus side, apart from the rather complicated roof, this is a really common and simple car, so breakers yards, car parts stores will be able to find bits for you absolutely anywhere, no problem at all. So day-to-day -day running costs and servicing will not break the bank. And that really is the beauty of a car like this. You'd struggle to pay more than about £2,000 for a really good one, but somewhere in that that one to two thousand pound mark you will find some really really good cars and this one is actually for sale it belongs to joseph lloyd of lloyd's vehicle consulting slash tweed jacket reviews it's his own car and it's going to be for sale well, it's for sale right now if you're interested for that relatively small outlay you get some pretty sharp looks the coupe vibe the sleek look a decent gearbox and here we are with the 1.8 so you get the um the right amount of performance and economy it's not too thirsty it's not too slow this is about as good as one of these is going to get. Now under load, the engine 
isn't exactly kind of sweet and sonorific, but it's not harsh and unpleasant either. It's, it's just engine noise, really. That sports exhaust on this car gives it a little bit more grunt and it sounds cool from outside as you're pulling away. It's not too intrusive on the move. It doesn't sound bad, but it doesn't make you want to keep on thrashing through the gears to, to just hear it a little bit longer. It's not that kind of a motor. Oh, the sun's out again. I was clearly not thinking of putting the roof down. Well, thank you for joining me today in a folding hardtop coupe convertible Vauxhall Astra. It's a long time since I've been in an Astra H of any form, whether it's a hatchback convertible or estate. I think the last time was a rental car about 10 years ago. So this has been a bit of a trip down, not really memories, because I've kind of forgotten all about it, Lane. Um, yeah, it's a curious little thing. You just don't really see many of these around anymore, do you? They used to be everywhere, and now they've just disappeared. Are they a bad car? No, not really. Are they as good as a Focus as a everyday car? Probably not. Are they a bit more interesting? Maybe. Maybe they are. Yeah, they're not a bad old bus if you think about it. And you've got... It's not a bad old bus and you combine the, the joys of soft top... It's not a bad old bus and you can combine the joy of roof down wind in your hair motoring with roof up metal roofed with and you can you have to compromise with this thing of if you've liked seeing this thing then hit like and subscribe leave a comment down below tell me if you love these cars i'm doing a disservice by not singing its praises more fully or if i'm being too nice to it and you think any astra of this generation should have been scrapped a long time ago tell me what you think let me know hit the bell notification for more in the future and i'll see you again very soon indeed with something utterly different, as always. Mm -hmm.